Elhamdülillahi Rabbil alemin ve afdalu salatu ve temu teslim ala eşrefil enbiya vel mursalin Seyyidina Muhammedin sadiq el emin el mebhuth rahmeten el alemin ve ala alihi el tahirin el tayyibin ve ala ashabihi ecma'in ve ala ezvacihi ummahatil müminin ve ala durriyetihi ila yevmiddin Subhanakallahumma la ilme lana illa ma allamtena inneke entel alimul hakim اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا اللهم علما وعملا متقبلا آمين يا رب العالمين إن شاء الله today we will talk about the determining principles of البدعة الحسنة the excellent innovation in Islam and we begin with the book of uh, our Sheikh, Sheikh al-Islam fi al-Balad al-Haram, Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi al-Maliki al-Hassani, rahimahullahu ta'ala wa nafa'na bihi wa bikum, amin. Manhaju al-Salaf fi fahmi al-Nusus bayna al-Nadariyyati wa al-Tatbiq. So the methodology of the early Muslims in the understanding of the texts or the legal stipulations between theory and application, he says, what is the first uh, first source for the classification of Bida? He says, the greatest lawgiver, Sayyidina Muhammad وسلم, is the reference. In his hadith, من سن في الإسلام سنة حسنة فله أجرها Whoever begins or initiates in Islam an excellent practice, then he has its reward. And the reward of whoever puts it into practice after him, مِنْ غَيْرِ أَنْ يَنْقُصَ مِنْ أُجُورِهِمْ شَيْءٌ Without their own rewards being lessened in the least. And whoever innovates or initiates in Islam a, an evil practice, then its onus or its the weight of its sin is upon him and as well as the weight of the sin of whoever puts it into practice after him without their own onus of sin being lessened in the least he states so in this hadith there is a classification and a subdividing of any matter that is initiated without a prior example or archetype or model. A dividing of that into what is acceptable and what is unacceptable. So this is the definition of uh, the sunnah hasana and the sunnah sayyi'ah here. It is al amru al mubtada min ghayri mithal, yani a, an, a matter that is initiated without a prior example. And this is the first of three major sources for our definition and our understanding of the bid'ah ah hasana. This is the first one of three hadiths to that effect. So it is a very important proof text, and this is the understanding of the majority of our teachers uh, and the majority of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah actually, the totality of our teachers. In English, that is the translation I gave in my book on uh, the Bid'ah Hasana, which adds examples as in the uh, highlighted section. So to start an act without precedent as proved by the hadiths of Khubayb. Khubayb was going to be put to death by the kuffar who had captured him, the kuffar of Najd. And uh, he and his group of the uh, Hufaz of Hadith had been captured uh, treacherously. And 
So he had been kept prisoner for a long time. And then some karamat happened to him, which they witnessed, but it did not change their mind to kill him, uh, which they did after torturing him. But before they started uh, doing that, they asked him if he had any last wish. He said, I want to pray two rak'ats. So he is the first one who did this innovation <laughs> in the religion of choosing the time of a certain uh, nafil worship, which is two rak'at for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before dying. The two rak'at of, uh, of, the, of the person that knows that they are going to die whether condemned to death or uh, seeing uh, uh, their disaster, uh, disastrous death coming to them uh, inevitably and so forth. So he prayed to Rak'at and then they started torturing him. And uh, they said, don't you wish Muhammad was in your place? And he, he said, no, I, I wish uh, I would avoid him even the thorn, a prick of the thorn in his heel, even if I had to pay such a price. And then he died. That is the hadith of Hubayb. Then the two narrations of Mu'adh and Ibn Mas'ud, who started a sunnah for you. Uh, on the right, Mu'adh ibn Jabal instituted a sunnah for you. So follow it exactly. That was spoken by the Prophet wasallam. So it was something that Mu'adh himself had initiated. And uh, it is explained in the footnotes. And the Prophet wasallam endorsed it. So uh, the Prophet ﷺ called it, he started a sunnah for you. That is the proof here for the hadith, whoever institutes a good practice in Islam. And the proof for our understanding and our translation of the same exactly in that way. And then uh, Ibn Mas'ud's, again, the same type of hadith. And Ibn Mas'ud is the one who said, whatever the Muslims consider right is right in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if uh, the Ummah considers that the celebration of Mawlid, for example, is right and correct. And so, so many of the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah gave their proofs and concurred o over it. Then that's it. You know, consider it uh, as a di divine stamp of approval. So this is in the Musnad of Imam Ahmad, and it's absolutely authentic as a statement of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet ﷺ also said in another hadith, whatever Ibn Mas'ud uh, gives you, take it. That is a like uh, tantamount to the hadith of uh, follow the sunnah of my rightly guided caliphs after me. Not up to that level, but tantamount to it. And then the narration in Al-Bukhari and Muslim stating that the son of Adam was the first to commit murder. In what terms? In terms of awwalu man sanna al-qatl. He made qatl. He is the one that made, uh, created the sunnah or sanna and initiated killing. Murder. So, Sanna Sunnatan Hasanatan is defined as Abada'aha Duna Sabiqatin Laha, originating it without any precedent for it. And that uh, was thus explained in Al Qutuf in Lugati Al Quran, which is a, a very large dictionary of the terms of the Quran and phrases and their uh, their lexical definitions according to the earliest uh, dictionaries and up to Taj al-Arus and uh, to modern dictionaries like, like Al-Mu'jam al, al wasiq uh, but that is certainly not as authoritative as the earlier ones. Then Ibn al-Athir said in an nihaya also a dictionary of uh, uh, terminology, ما لم يكن له مثال موجود that is the uh, the Sunnah Hasana in this hadith. It does not have a prior example of good deeds, uh, ma'roof, and all the excellent actions. And he gives this hadith as an example. And as the Mahshari defines Sunnah Sunnatan as Tarraqa Tariqatan, he opened a path, same as Sunnah Sunnatan, because Sunnah also means a path, just like Sharia does also Sirat, Tariq, Tariqa, and so forth. Hafiz ibn Allan said in his commentary on Riyadh al-Salihi, man sanna fil islami sunnatan hasanatan, ay tariqatan mardiyatan, yani a well-pleasing and, and accepted path, 
وَإِنْ لَمْ يَكُنْ حُسْنُهَا بِالنَّصْ Even if it's husn, it, if it's excellent, is not by legal stipulation in the sharia, بَلْ بِالْإِسْتِنْبَاتْ But rather by inference. And then there is other uh, examples, including uh, the, uh, the definition of Sheikh Mustafa Bugha at the very end. And this is the sharh of Riyadh al-Salihin by Ibn Kamal Basha, one of the great Ottoman uh, scholars, died in the 10th century. He said, Man sanna fil Islam, to the end of that hadith, there is in that an exhortation to innovate and start and initiate good things. So whoever in, uh, initiates in Islam a good sunnah, that, that is precisely the meaning of the bid'ah hasana, except that the term sunnah is much better than the term bid'ah, because bid'ah is also used in the uh, mostly in the negative sense, whereas sunnah is used mostly in the positive sense. وَسَنَّ السُّنَّنَ الْحَسَنَاتِ وَالتَّحْذِيرِ مِنْ اِخْتِرَاعِ الْأَبَاطِيلِ وَالْمُسْتَقَبَحَاتِ So there is a, an exhortation to good deeds and a warning against bad ones and ugly ones. And at the bottom of his definition in that box, وَفِي هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ تَخْسِيسُ قَوْلِهِ There is in this hadith a specification of his statement that كُلُّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ Every new or novel matter is a bid'ah. يعني uh, a uh, rejected innovation or uh, an innovation, let's say, in general terms. وَكُلُّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ And every innovation is misguidance. So he says what is meant by that innovation here is the batil muhdathat, يعني the uh, the false novel matters, the bad novel matters, and the blameworthy uh, innovations. So you see, تخصيص للحديث. In other words, the hadith كل محدثة بدعة is not just you take it you know un, in unqualified terms. It needs specification. It needs a specific understanding. If you take it in an uh, absolute understanding, you have gone astray. You have fallen into bid'ah actually by doing that. This uh, is the second hadith also that serves as a proof for the uh, bid'ah hasana by uh, contrapositive uh, reasoning. In other words, since it has to be uh, specified and understood specifically, then the pendant of it is that there is a good bid'ah. So the, the hadith states, إِنَّ كُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٌ وَكُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ رواه أحمد أبو داود وابن ماجا والنسائي from several uh, companions. And النسائي has a, an addition which is not authentic uh, the way that the, uh, the previous hadith is. وَكُلُّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ And every uh, misguidance is in the fire. So the... Um, concurred upon and agreed upon segment is every newfangled matter is an innovation and every innovation is misguidance. In a book by Sheikh Salah al-Din ibn Ahmad al-Idlibi, one of the muhadiths of Syria from Idlib province, he discusses at length the, the word kul, every, because the natural objection here would be to say, well, if the Prophet ﷺ said every, then it means every. That's it. كُلُّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ Every innovation is misguidance. So uh, what is there to discuss after that? And how can it possibly be a proof for the contrary that there are some bid'ah that are not uh, misguidance? Well, because kul is used in the Quran in absolute terms and it's used also in relative terms. And since there are hadiths that show that the uh, bid'ah can be understood in relative terms, as in the, the first hadith uh, that we investigated, then kul has to, uh, to be understood that way. So the kul in the absolute sense is when Allah says, for example, wallahu bi kulli shay'in alim, and Allah is all knowing of everything. Wallahu la yuhibbu kulla kaffarin athim, and Allah does not love every sinful disbeliever. So he gives other examples, and then he gives examples of kul, which is understood not in the absolute sense. For example, فَلَمَّا نَسُوا مَا ذُكِّرُوا بِهِ 
So when they forgot what they had been reminded of, in, in other words, they forgot the divine reminder. We opened up for them the gates of everything. Now that's everything. means everything in dunya. Every temptation, every pleasure, every wealth, every cause and pitfall for misguidance which they entered. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just no longer uh, privileged them with guidance. Because they had forgotten everything that they had been reminded of. So in other words, it is not open for them the gates of guidance. Therefore, kull, kull shay, everything does not mean absolutely everything without exception. Another verse, ثُمَّ آتَيْنَا مُوسَى الْكِتَابَ تَمَامًا عَلَى الَّذِي أَحْسَنَ وَتَفْصِيلًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ Then we gave Musa the book as a completion uh, because of that which he had excelled in, in, in good deeds and belief and obedience and so forth. And tafsilan and as a detailing for everything. So this was explained by the ulama of tafsir as, as a detailing of everything that the Banu Israel needed and that Musa needed for their, uh, for their uh, advice and their guidance. Not everything in absolute terms. Another verse, وَقَالَ يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسِ عُلِّمْنَا مَنْطِقَ الطَّيْرِ وَأُوْتِينَا مِنْ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ O oh, people, we, uh, he said, meaning uh, Sulaiman, that we have been given the uh, the understanding of the language of birds and we were given of everything meaning of everything what of whatever he had been given again in relative terms and then these the uh, destruction that had been sent on one of the kuffar nations of old to dammiru kull shay the wind that was sent against them the saiqa uh, the, the tempest uh, that destroyed them, destroying everything, bi amri rabbiha, by command of its Lord. And then, فَأَصْبَحُوا لَا يُرَى إِلَّا مَسَاكِنُهُمْ And in the morning, nothing could be seen except their dwellings. So in other words, it destroyed everything, but not their dwellings. And also, it did not destroy their prophet. It did not destroy the believers uh, that were with their prophet. So, uh, Again, kul here is selective and relative. Everything is selective and relative here. So he concludes here, فَلَا يُمْكِنُ أَن نَفْهَمَ It is impossible, therefore, for us to understand. This is highlighted. قَوْلَهُ صلى الله عليه وسلم وَكُلُّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ وَكُلُّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ We cannot understand that hadith على العموم الشامل uh, in the sense of an all-inclusive generality. بل نقول, however, we say المعنى أن كل محدثة مما لا يندرج تحت نص من نصوص الكتاب أو السنة. The sense is that every newfangled matter which is not subsumed under a legal text of the legal text of the book and the سنة ولا يتفق مع مقاصدهما and does not uh, click or concur with uh, the objectives of the book and the سنة that is the bid'ah matmuma. That is the blameworthy innovation. So, it is a specific understanding of the uh, hadith that is couched in all inclusive terms. So he concludes uh, this whole section with several points that are all important, but I highlighted two of them especially. The first one, الأحاديث النبوية والآثار المروية عن الصحابة والتابعين تؤكد أنه ليست كل كل ليست كل المستحدثات في الدين من بدع الضلالة. The prophetic hadiths and the companion reports all assure us, as well as the tabi'in reports, that not all novel matters in the religion. This is very important. When we talk about novel matters here, we are not talking about novel matters in dunya which is a, a distinction that uh, was innovated or started, I think, uh, no sooner or no earlier than Ibn Taymiyyah, which people after his time uh, have mentioned more and more. But here we are talking about the novel matters in the religion. Not all of them are of the 
innovations of misguidance. And I will give you more examples in a minute, inshallah. The second point, Al-Imaman al-Shafi'i wa ibn Hanbal wa jumhuru ahli al-ilmi madhhabuhum huwa ma jaa fi al-ahadith wa al-asar. Their madhhab to those people and the vast, massive majority of the scholars is everything that came in the hadiths and the reports to the effect that the uh, novel matters, among them there is what is praiseworthy and among them there is what is blameworthy. And that is what Ibn Taymiyyah himself stipulated in one of his statements. So he has conflicting statements, self -con mutually contradictory statements. But at least we can say that in one of those statements, he actually said that. This is the translation uh, also taken from my book on uh, uh, the excellent innovation. of Some of the verses that I mentioned. And there is more examples of the same gist, but not using kulla or kullu. They are couched in an all-inclusive manner, but they imply exceptions. For example, and consult with them upon the conduct of affairs, Allah said to the Holy Prophet But even Abbas said, this is specifically understood, not uh, universally understood, not just the conduct of all affairs, no, in some of the affairs. Then the universal understood in terms of the specific. More examples from the Sunnah. The Prophet ﷺ sent a military detachment uh, under the command of one of the companions. And he said to them, obey your leader faithfully. But in the course of the expedition, that leader, the commander, became angry with them. He, he built a fire. He lit it and he ordered them to enter it. They all refused, saying, and, but some of them, some of them were motioning to, uh, thinking of entering it and they were thinking to themselves, but others refused, saying, no, we, we, فَرَرْنَا إِلَى رَسُولِ اللَّهِ مِنَ النَّارِ We have fled to the messenger of Allah to get away from the fire, not to enter it. So they came back and then the Prophet ﷺ said, had they entered it, they would not have come out of it until the day of resurrection. Obedience is only in good matters. So you see, uh, he said to them, obey your leader faithfully. And then the verse says, obey Allah and obey the messenger. And those of you who are in, author in authority, so the primary meaning is, you know, political authority and leadership. Uh, in uh, dunya matters, especially military matters, because uh, it is a matter of life and death to be obeying and not to desert, not to disobey, but not in uh, bad matters, not in uh, sin, in crime, and so forth. So the verse itself also is absolute only for Allah and His Messenger. You see, أَطِيعُ اللَّهُ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولُ وَأُولِي الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ each one of Allah and the Messenger have the verb obey right before them. You see? So obey Allah, obey the Messenger. But then the third segment is put into conjunction. I mean, there is a copulative conjunction here as if there is a, it is at a lesser level of strength because no obedience whatsoever is due to creatures in disobedience of Allah. So we have to to understand all of these uh, proofs in, in, in that sense. Everything of the body of the human being will be consumed by the earth, except for Ajb al dhanab yani the, the coccyx, which is the triangular uh, bone at the uh, bottom of the spine of human beings, right? But uh, the bodies of prophets are not eaten by the earth we, and the martyrs also. So this is understood from other hadiths. We have to Put the picture together. We have to be holistic and understanding Quran and Sunnah. We can't understand uh, it in, in, in partial terms, in a vacuum, apart from each other and apart from the proofs of, uh, of, of themselves that they all provide. So uh, you can't just understand, jump and then, you know, uh, cut and uh, take what you need or what you want. That is exactly bid'ah. That is following hawa, following proclivities falling into misguidance and misguiding others. And there's more examples which I encourage you to read on your own. Imam Nawawi in his Sharh of Sahih Muslim, again in the hadith, كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة. He says, قوله صلى الله عليه وسلم وكل بدعة ضلالة that every bid'a is a misguidance. هذا عام مخصوص. This is a general 
terminology that is understood in specific terms. Mahsus, it is uh, understood specific. It is specified. Wal muradu, and what is meant is ghalibul bida. Most of the innovations. Qala ahlul lugha, the lexicologists said, hiya kullu shay'in umila ala ghayri mithalin sabiqin. He said that the bid'a is everything that was done without prior archetype or prior example. Kalimatun ilmiyatun hadiyatun fil bid'ati wa ahkamiha. A knowledgeable or a word of knowledge that guides the reader concerning innovation and its rulings. It's by my teacher, uh, Sheikh Wahbi Sulaiman Ghawji Al Albani. Uh, Sheikh Wahbi uh, passed away, Rahimahullah. May Allah grant him Aliyin and reward him on behalf of the Ummah. Ameen. Most of his shuyukh were Albanian and Macedonian shuyukh. And he was also a student of uh, Sheikh Muhammad Zahid Al Kawthari when he was at Al Azhar. Rahimahullah. And this is the third hadith, which is also acting as a specifier for every innovation is misguidance. And the hadith that I mean is Man ahdatha fi amrina hava ma laysa minhu fahuwa rad. Whoever innovates in this matter of ours, what is not part of it, then it is rejected or he is rejected. It can be translated either way. And then there is another wording of this hadith, and they are both in Sahih Muslim. Man ahdatha fi dinina, religious innovation. So this is to make clear to you, O oh, person who is always trying to read it in a certain way so as to uh, follow your proclivity in what you wish to understand and what you wish to run away from. The wording here says, whoever innovates in our deen, in our faith system, what is not part of it, then it is rejected or he is rejected. So religious innovation. قال ابن رجب هذا يدل بمنطوقه على أن كل عمل ليس عليه أمر الشارع فهو مردود. So this with its uh, very expression indicates that every act that is not uh, according to the uh, command of the lawgiver is rejected. ويدل بمفهومه and its gist indicates على أن كل عمل عليه أمره فهو غير مردود that every deed, every practice that is according to the lawgiver's command, then it is certainly not rejected. See, this is a very important uh, point. مفهوم المخالفة contrapositive proof or what the contrary indicates. So the contrapositive proof of uh, what is not part of our religion is rejected, is what is part of our religion is never rejected. See, our Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Nuruddin Hitr said, this is the greatest proof actually for the uh, Bid'at al-Hasana. Most important proof and clearest proof and the most explicit proof. And in the last box, uh, there is more remarks to that effect and an explanation of this very same point by Sheikh Abdullah Siddiq Al-Ghumari, also one of uh, the shuyukh of our teachers. And one of our uh, shuyukh also because he gave an ijaza Am. Now, the famous report of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa arda. Umar during his caliphate, and this is taken from my book on Bid'at al-Hasana, report number 76. You can look it up there. It's available on the net. He gathered the multifarious groups praying taraweeh into a single congregation. Ubay ibn Ka'ab said, this was not done before. In hadha lam yakun. So the, it was very clearly an innovation, you see. It was not something that someone uh, can say, like the author of the book that we are going to analyze in a minute in detail, he claims that, oh, no, it's something that the Prophet ﷺ did, he just revived it. No, if it were, then people would not have said what they said. Ubay would never have said this was not done before. So, inna hadha lam yakun. And Umar would not have said, I am fully aware of this. But, nevertheless, it is excellent. Qad alimtu. 
hasan. So this is a not only he said this is a bid'ah, he said this is a bid'ah hasana. They want to make ta'til of that, they want to annul, invalidate, cancel out, and run away from it and convince you that he, he didn't mean it, he meant the opposite. So he said it is a bid'ah, but he didn't mean it is a bid'ah. That's what they understand from it. But no, we understand it exactly as he said, Alhamdulillah, we take it on face value and we put it in the mizan, yani the balance of the understanding of the jumhur of the ummah of Ahl sunnati wal jama'ah, Alhamdulillah. So uh, he also said, what a fine innovation this is. Ni'amati al-bid'ah to have. Yani he used the heaviest term possible, bid'ah. And he put ni'mati al-bid'atu hadi. What a wonderful innovation this is. So there is no doubt that it was an innovation. And in what aspects was this, is it an innovation? I put it uh, here for you in a box. Three innovative aspects in the prayer of the Qiyamul Layl. Because the, uh, this was the prayer of Ramadan. And Qiyamul Layl is supposed to be at the end of the night. So one of the innovated aspects that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu did was he shifted it to the earlier time of the night, as opposed to the later time for the greater jama'ah. That's one. Two, so this was not in the time of the Prophet sallallahu This was Sayyidina Umar's innovation. Then a single congregation as opposed to multiple ones. Again, this was not in the time of the Prophet sallallahu in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu even when he came out, there are people in their houses, in their own uh, mosques and so on, uh, private mosques, uh, that were praying the Qiyamul Layl at that time, yani late at night, in their own congregations. But Sayyidina Umar, as if abolishing all that, he made it a single congregation for the men and another single congregation for the women, and that's it. And that became the taraweeh that the ummah practices most, yani mostly, although it is valid also to pray it alone, but uh, the, the sunnah uh, that was inherited from Sayyidina Umar and in his wake Sayyidina Uthman and Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhum was that it is prayed in the mosque, a single congregation in the mosque of taraweeh. And then a fixed amount of 20 rak'at as opposed to unfixed, because in the time of the Prophet it was unfixed. It was at times this, at times that. And there was no doubt among the companions that it was an excellent innovation. And it was both this, both of them. It was an innovation and it was an excellent innovation. So there is more about it that you can read to the same effects on the page when you have time, inshallah. So these are the uh, two riwayas from Sayyidina Imam al-Shafi'i, where he understands it exactly the way that we have des described, that it is an innovation that is praiseworthy, and uh, that is the archetypal example for it from the uh, practice of the Salaf al-Salih, yani the hadith of Sayyidina Umar so from al rabi ibn Sulaiman al-Muradi, the uh, close student of Imam al-Shafi'i said, قَالَ قَالَ الشَّافِعِي رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ الْمُحْدَثَاتُ مِنَ الْأُمُورِ ضَرْبَان He said, يعني, novel matters are two types. أحدهما, the first one, ما أحدث يخالف كتابا أو سنة أو أثرا أو إجماع. Whatever was innovated that is transgressing or differing, contravening, or contradicting uh, something of the book, or something of the sunnah, or a report, meaning of the Sahaba al-Kiram, especially the Khulafa al-Rashidin, and the people of authority among the Sahaba, and uh, the Tabi'in, or ijma'an, or a consensus. فَهَذِهِ الْبِدْعَةُ That, or this, is the uh, misguided innovation or the innovation of misguidance. Wathaniya to the second type is ma uhdifa min al khair, whatever goodness. This is a very important qaida, a principle that if the innovation is goodness and excellence and it's something that we know 
يعني we understand should be done in the practice of religion لا خلاف فيه لواحد من هذا no one of, uh, co contradicts that uh, that it is certainly something excellent فهذه محدثة غير مذمومة that is a novel matter that is not blameworthy وقد قال عمر رضي الله عنه في قيام شهر رمضان and Sayyidina Umar said Allah be all pleased with him about the uh, standing at nights in, during the month of Ramadan نعمت البدعة هذه what a wonderful innovation this is يعني أنها محدثة لم تكن وإن كانت فليس فيها رد لما مضى in other words it is novel it, it was not in existence before so this first one is from uh, Imam Al-Bayhaqi's book Al-Madkhal ila Sunanin al-Kubra and the second one is from Hilyat al-Awliya uh, by uh, Abu Nu'aym al-Asfahani they were contemporaries Al-Bayhaqi being, being the younger one of the two so he narrates it Abu Nu'aym from uh, Abu Bakr al-Ajuri the great uh, Shafi'i uh, Faqih and uh, Muhaddith with his chain to Harmalat ibn Yahya, another uh, companion of Imam al-Shafi'i. He said, Samiyat Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i. He said, I heard uh, al-Shafi'i say, Al-Bid'atu bid'atan. Bid'a is two types of bid'a. Bid'atun mahmudatun wa bid'atun matmuma. Praiseworthy bid'a and blameworthy bid'a. This is an imam of the Salaf al-Salih. This is an imam of the four imams that is giving you this terminology. This is not from his pocket. This is from... Uh, whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired him as an imam of the salaf that was blessed with a superlative understanding above the norm. Whatever concurs with the sunnah, it is praiseworthy. And whatever contravenes the sunnah or uh, disagrees with it, this is blameworthy. واحتج بقول عمر بن الخطاب في قيام رمضان نعمة البدعة هي What a wonderful bid'a it is So he used that, الشافع used that as his حجة, his conclusive proof الحمد لله Same discussion in writing so you can look it up with all of the references The first innovation after the time of the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم was a shaba to eat to one's fill. Subhanallah, how we even claim it proudly without uh, shame. When we, would you like some more? No, I'm full. Alhamdulillah, I'm full. That, <laughs> that was the first bid'ah after the time of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, according to our mother, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, anha. It is not directly connected to the religion, but it is connected to the religion because, of course, it is something that the Prophet ﷺ discussed as part of his sunnah. It is a sunnah of hidayah to understand that, you know, eating frugally is best, that the uh, the mu'min eats uh, with one uh, intestine as opposed to the kafir who eats with seven and other such hadiths about food and uh, manners of eating and the adab of eating. So, um, these are some of the authorities' definitions for the bid'a. Al-Jurjani said, whatever contrivance contradicts the sunnah. Imam Abu Shama and Imam Asuyuti said, everything invented without precedent basis. And Al-Laknawi says, whatever has no basis among the four foundations of Islam and did not exist in the first three centuries. So not well, the four foundations, not just Quran and Sunnah, but also uh, consensus, as Imam al-Shafi'i said, and Qiyas, as they later agreed upon, meaning analogy. This is a very important distinction. So you have to dig well. You can't just jump at the throat of the next person saying, it is, where is this in the Quran? Where is this in the Sunnah? And you stop there. That is what people of bid'ah uh, do. But Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah always uh, include Ijma' and the vast, massive majority also include Qiyas. See, Risalat al-Mustarshideen of Imam al-Muhasibi says Quran, Sunnah and Ijma'. 
אני קורא לזה ג'מאעה, אימאם א-טחאווי קורא לזה ג'מאעה אולסו, היא מין זה ג'מאעה. So this is very important and this allows us to run away from the uh, sectarian thinking of the non-Sunni sects. So note the common denominator of all of these definitions. Look, Ibn al-Jawzi said, contravening the foundations of the law. So that is what bid'ah is in legal convention. And uh, Qadi Abu Bakr ibn al-Arabi al-Ma'afiri, the great Maliki Faqih, he said, only the bid'ah that contradicts the sunnah is blameworthy. In other words, he understands that there is a, a binary subdivision of bid'ah in more specific terms than what the hadith uh, states, as we have already demonstrated. So the common denominator is that it has no proof. And this is very important. And this is in all of the uh, definitions that are accepted, the Mu'tabara definitions of the bid'ah. If a definition does not have that common denominator, it is Ghayr Mu'tabara. Imam al-Ghazali also has an identical definition. It follows Imam al-Shafi'i's binary subdivision. So the bid'ah in the religion is everything that did not come to us in the Quran, nor from the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu uh, Alaihi This is what Ibn Hazm says, except that one is rewarded for some of it, and those who do this are excused if they have good intentions. This is a very interesting phrase. How can you be rewarded for some of the bid'ah in the religion, which did not come to us in the Quran, nor from the Messenger of Allah? Well, if they have good intentions, and if they have, for example, ijtihad, if they take it from what they think is the Quran, Sunnah, Ijma, or Qiyas, but they're wrong, and so on and so forth. But what is most interesting is that Ibn Taymiyyah takes this and quotes it verbatim and endorses it in uh, his discussion on Mawlid in his book, uh, Iqtida al Sirat al Mustaqim. Mukhalafat uh, Ashab al Jahim, Fil Iqtida bi Sirat al Mustaqim. Uh, which is his book on uh, Sunnah and Bid'ah and the definition of Bid'ah in there. And he, his example for exactly that is the celebration of the Mawlid. So Ibn Hazm continues, he says, of it is the rewardable and excellent, Hassan, namely what is basically permitted. So he clearly understands exactly what uh, Sayyidina Omar uh, meant, exactly what Imam al-Shafi'i said. Remember, Ibn Hazm started as a Shafi'i. And uh, his sheikh in the Zahiri Mazhab, Dawood al-Zahiri, started as a Shafi'i as well. And of it is the blameworthy. So you can see here the beginning of the definition that is later given uh, by Ibn Abd salam as a five-fold definition. Yani breaking down the binary definition of uh, Imam al-Shafi'i, which is based on the practice and the statements of the Sahaba al-Kiram before him, Breaking it down, it leads naturally to the five-fold definition. Yet another alim, Imam al-Zahabi calls him al-Allamat al-Bahr. And he was an ocean of knowledge and erudition. And uh, he knew many sciences. He wasn't, he wasn't just an arch jurist. He was a great hafiz of hadith. He's mentioned in, in uh, Tadkirat al-Hufaz also, Imam al-Zahabi. And uh, he was a mathematician as well. He was a... Uh, an astronomer, a geographer, and uh, he was a linguist as well, and uh, an adib of literature. So he said in his ta'liq on uh, the muwatta of Imam Malik, bid'ah is of two types, and so on and so forth. And he quotes Sayyidina Omar's uh, reports. And he takes as his example also, and when Uthman unified the people over a single mushaf, and before that, when Abu Bakr compiled the Quran, and compiling the Quran was for sure a bid'ah according to the companions, they all treated it as such. They had no doubt about it. Sayyidina Abu Bakr, when Sayyidina Umar suggested it to him, he said, how could we do something the Prophet ﷺ did not do? And it has to do something with the religion, for sure. And then Umar said, by Allah, it is good. You see the principle that if, if there is goodness in it, then you must investigate it. Omar persisted until Allah changed uh, Abu Bakr's heart to acceptance. 
he sent for Zaid ibn Thabit, he had the same reaction, Zaid, as Sayyidina Abu Bakr at first. He said, how could you do something the Prophet Sallallahu did not do? And he found it extremely difficult. So if they had asked me to move a mountain, it would not have been more difficult than to compile the Quran. And then finally, also his heart was expanded for it. So more definitions, Ibn al-Athir al-Jazari in an nihaya and then Ibn Abd al-Salam's uh, final five full classification, which everyone after him endorsed, everyone in the Shafi'i Mazhab and the majority of the other two schools and many of the Hanbalis. So including Imam al-Nawawi, Shaykh al-Islam, he endorsed the five-fold uh, subdivision. Ibn Hajar for sure in, endorsed it also. I give all of the references. So among the Hanafis, those that endorse, I mentioned the names of some of the prominent Imams. This is not an exhaustive list, by the way, but you can see how large they loom. Ibn Abidin, Al-Kirmani, Al-Turkmani, uh, the one that wrote a commentary on the Sunan Al-Kubra of uh, Imam Al-Bayhaqi, this that Turkmani. And Al-Aini who wrote also a massive commentary on, uh, on Sahih Al-Bukhari. Ibrahim Al-Halabi, one of the muhaqiqeen in uh, Hanafi fiqh and at, at uh, Tahanawi also, more modern. Among the Malikis, at Turtushi, Ibn al-Hajj, al-Qarafi, they all wrote on bid'ah, you see, and they all endorsed that five-fold uh, subdivision. As zarqani the Ash-Shatibi objected, and he said it was an invented matter without proof in the law. That the Malikis did not f follow him in that. Although they found his writing brilliant and so on and so forth, but his... his uh, his books are not textbook in the uh, discussion of bid'ah. And then consensus among the Shafi'is and reluctant acceptance among later Hanbalis, but they altered as Shafi'i and Ibn Abdul Salam's terminology. Some of them did, but many of them did not. And the alteration was to change it to bid'ah lughawiya, lexical innovation and legal innovation, bid'ah shar'iya which is not a precise change in, uh, they do not correspond to uh, what Ash-Shafi'i meant. So there is a big tasamuh in that. We come to this book by uh, Dr. Muhammad Asri bin Zainul Abidin, Bid'a Hasana, the misunderstood term. Did this book make it uh, less misunderstood or more misunderstood? That is the question, unfortunately. Now, he starts with this definition of the lexical sense of uh, bid'a. He says, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Razi rahimahullah said in his uh, Mukhtar al-Sihah. So he was a seventh century lexicographer who is summarizing Imam al-Jawhari's uh, al-Sihah fi al Yani the uh, soundest entries or understandings or definitions for, for the Arabic language. But he says that, that's what the, the author writes. He writes, Bada'ash Shay. But it's not Bada'a. Al Razi does not say Bada'ash Shay in his book. He says, Abada'ash Shay. Abada'ash Shay. Where is the Hamza? Ya Shaykh. <laughs> Muhammad Asri. Why you drop the... Uh, it is, so it is a fourth form. It is not a first form uh, verb here. Abda'a, uh, af'ala. Yubdi'u. So, ibda'an. Abda'a shay. Ikhtara'ahu. Ikhtara'an. La ala mithal. That's the first uh, error. Wrong spelling. The second error is wrong translation. He insists on translating it as making bid'ah. He's, he's saying this is a linguistic definition. Linguistic definition, according to his criteria, is that it is just about starting something. This is how abda'a, a shay, uh, should be translated. Because this is what, for example, badi' as samawati wal ard the originator of the heavens and earth, Jalla Jalalu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who originated them without any prior archetype 
or blueprint or pattern or model or example as can be also said as as it said here and this is fine so why making bid'ah because you, you just want to use that term bid'ah no say <laughs> initiating and then there is selective quotation because the real quotation that he should be quoting is not this one from Arazi. It's what Arazi says in the next line. And I'm going to show it to you on the next page. And then incorrect generalization, which is nearly all the Arabic Mu'ajam state are almost the same meaning. This is incorrect. And then false conclusion, which is this is the linguistic definition of Bid'a. No, this is not the linguistic definition of Bid'a. We are going to mention that in a minute. So the correct translation should be al bidah is the novel matter in the faith system after the latter's completion this is what arazi states in the next line al bid'atu al hadathu fi din ba'd al ikmal that is the linguistic definition that he gives so abda al shay simply means he started something inventing it without archetype or original model and in reality nearly all of the arabic mu'ajams and i give you here so many examples before and after abu bakr al-razi starting with the first dictionary in the arabic language by al-khalil al-farahidi kitab al-ayn the book of ayn al-bid'atu mastuhdithat ba'da rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min ahwa wa a'mal bid'a is what was innovated or uh, newly newly made or brought after the messenger of Allah of whims, proclivities, and of acts. And in Mu'jam Diwan Al-Adab by Al-Farabi Al-Bid'a, Naqeed Al-Sunnah. Bid'a is the opposite of Sunnah. And in As-Sihah of Al-Jawahari, Al-Bid'a Al-Hadathu fi al-Din ba'da al-Ikmal. And in Al-Muhkam Al-Muhayt Al-A'zam li Ibn Sida, in the fifth century. So I give you from each century, except for the third century, I did not have anyone. And they all concur on the fact that it is an innovation in the religion. I put them all together, and the correct conclusion is therefore the linguistic definition of Vida is any post prophetic novel matter occurring in the deen after its completion in opposition to the sunnah of. Faith, يعني, of faith, يعني, uh, for example, faith systems that are innovated, views that are innovated, and trends that are innovated. يعني, ahwa can be translated by trends also, whims, proclivities, tendencies. Okay, so this is the linguistic definition of Vida. This is what the, the conclusion should be because this is what all of these uh, dictionaries give you and none of them says this is not a linguistic definition so that's what the book starts with and it is a very poor start indeed it is filled with uh, very questionable choices not to say falsehoods i checked even in the malay version the malay version is worse he says uh, uh, this is how it is found in all of the dictionaries, not just, you see here he says, nearly all the Arabic Mu'ajams state almost the same meaning. <laughs> but in Malay he says all of them, all of them state the same meaning. Ya yeah, subhanallah. Yani, th th this is uh, sad to say that you make light of your English speaking public and even more you consider uh, the as imbeciles even more the Malay speaking public, this is uh, this is wrong. Please revise it. So, the two definitions for al bid'a, both the lexical and the technical, are one and the same. That is the conclusion by Imam Al Nawawi in Tahdib Al Asma Wal Lughat and Al Fayruz Abadi in the Qamus, namely Al Hadathu fi Din, the novelty in the faith system not just the uh, novelty in, uh, in dunya that is unrelated to the deen. Wallahu ta'ala a'lamu wa ahkam. Sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I will open the floor to 
anyone and everyone that has any question. So you can uh, put your microphone on before you uh, you ask. I will try my best to address it, inshallah. Further. If, uh, for example, the word was used sana in relation to the earliest Quranic teachers, you mentioned Ibn Mas'ud and Mu'az bin Jabal. Um, why was that word not carried on um, until, until we had to wait for Saidina Omar to use the negative connotation of Bida'a, which then he put together with Hasana? That's the first question. The second question was, um, well, these two questions actually relate to previous experiences where I've had in um, having to argue with some people. The first one was in regards to Saidina Omar. And um, of course, you know, he's famous for great innovations. I think he even is the first one who invented road signs for the whole world. Um, yeah. So um, in regards to that, you know, one time a Wahhabi told me, he said that, oh, that's because the Prophet Wasallam said, if there were to be another Prophet after me, it would have been Omar. So it's all right for him to do it. Okay, so I, I just didn't know how to, <laughs> how to answer from that one. Um, the last one is perhaps in regards to uh, uh, Arazi's definition just now. And if Arazi's definition included the word deen, how would we answer if somebody said, oh, okay, then this is in regards to this Al-Ma'idah verse 13. This day I have completed the religion for you, the deen and chosen Islam. So therefore, the deen is complete then. I'll start with the third question, that the deen is complete. So they concurred on the tafsir of that, and many of our ulama, of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, among my teachers and others, mentioned in their treatment of, of this uh, subject that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not mean by that that all of the juz'iyat of the deen, all of the particulars of the faith system, uh, were addressed. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says so many times in the Holy Quran for us to use our hearts and minds and efforts and istinbat, uh, extraction and inference and so on and so forth uh, to get more reward in understanding his book and his rulings and in seeking uh, to perfect our practice of, of his command and of the Prophet's Sunnah as well. So, deen is complete, meaning the revelation is complete, and then now the work is still has to be done. Why do you think? Why do we think? Yani, there are so many tafsirs that are still being uh, produced, but now Al Baydawi, in the preamble to his tafsir, he says, Blessed is the one that contributes to the edifice of Rasulullah. The edifice of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yani, by reading tafsirs, by writing tafsirs, by uh, teaching tafsirs and learning and understanding, and you know, I feel blessed because I've been involved in translating a tafsir. So uh, that is contributing to the edifice of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this continues until qiyamah. Uh -huh. But isn't the deen complete? Will one say? But this this would be an invitation to laziness. And to ikhlad uh, ilal ard, yani sitting uh, on our uh, behinds and doing nothing. Crossing our arms, the deen is complete. Wait a minute. Uh, there is work to be done. The deen is, is complete. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, now get to work. So uh, we have to complete ourselves using the deen also. Then the first question is why not use sunnah, sun, sunnah, sunnatan, more, instead of bid'ah, which is uh, the negative term. In fact, that is what uh, people have said also among the scholars uh, of this topic. They said a good term would be instead of bid'a hasana, sunnatun idafiya, yani a supplementary sunnah, a sunnah that is, uh, yani an annex sunnah, a sunnah that is not prophetically stipulated or legislated. It is not a legislative sunnah. It's not a sunnah tashri'iya, يعني, because only the Prophet وسلم, would be the musharri' for us. Only the Prophet is the legislator. But it is a sunnah that is under the aegis of the Prophet's law, 
and of the divine uh, word. See, it is a sunnah that is uh, inferred from uh, one of the four foundations. And uh, in this, in this uh, example, or the, in this respect, from Qiyas, most probably, if not from Ijma. And the second question, and last one, uh, if there were a prophet after me, it would have been Sayyidina Umar. What is known for sure is that the Prophet ﷺ said, there is no prophet after me. You see? But if he had uh, if he had lived, then Ibrahim would have been uh, a prophet, but he was not muqaddar uh, uh, to live. He did not live. Uh, his son, Sayyidina Ibrahim ﷺ. So it is a immense uh, praise for Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, his son, and for Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu Allah, that uh, Allah gave him muwafaqat, meaning congruences with the, with the book of Allah and with the Prophet's uh, rulings also, that Sayyidina Umar would run to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and say something, and then revelation would come and confirm that, and concur with that, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi meant that as well when he said that if there were a uh, prophet, but that does not mean that we take uh, Sayyidina Omar's word above Sayyidina Abu Bakr's word, for example. No, because still, still despite all this, Sayyidina Abu Bakr uh, takes, takes priority and has preference over Sayyidina Omar by, the, by uh, the divine stipulation at the hand of the Prophet Sallallahu who spoke it. Look at that Sayyidina Abu Bakr is the best of the Ummah and then Sayyidina Umar. So, uh, but Sayyidina Umar uh, radiallahu ta'ala anhu was given those lights and uh, also uh, ruled for a long time, much longer time than, I mean, for uh, more than uh, 10 years. Uh, 15 years, Shay. 15, uh, yeah. uh, 12 years or so. Uh, and uh, Whereas Sayyidina, Sayyidina Abu Bakr only two years uh, and some. So there was no time uh, maybe for things to develop as much as they did under Sayyidina Umar. Wallahu alam. I want to ask you some things about Wahhabi's ideology. They call Bida'ah Hasanah wal Bida'ah Dalalah. Bida'ah bida Hasanah. Only for dunya. That is mazhab wahhabis. And bid'ah dalalah. Only for ibadah. Uh, so I want to ask you. Who among the Islamic scholar thinks so? Well. This, this subdivision is itself a bid'ah actually. According to Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi al-Maliki. In the book that I mentioned. He discusses that. He says, you may call it like that and say it's a bid'a dunyawiyya and bid'a diniyya. Bid'a dunyawiyya, bid'a diniyya. So they say bid'a fi din, bid'a fi dunya. The bid'a fi dunya is good, they say. The bid'a fi din is bad, right? As you said. But this is not true. There can be good and bad in each of the two. Good and bad in each of the two. I'll give you an example of each of those. There's four examples I have to give you, right? So, Sayyidina Uwais al-Qarani. He would not eat from, uh, from other than uh, refuse heaps. He would go around and see what people were throwing out of their houses and the food that people did not want to eat and the clothes that they did not want to wear. This is mentioned by Imam Ahmad ibn Hanban and narrated from him by uh, Abu Bakr al-Khallal in a book called The Exhortation to Work. al hathu ala sina'ati wal-amal. This was a book for the Sufis. Well, some Sufis uh, wanted to leave dunya completely, so Imam Ahmad had a lot of advice for them. He loved the Sufis. He was very Sufi himself. So there was a group of Sufis that came to him and he said, they said, we want to be like Uwais al-Qarani. He said, you can never be like Uwais al-Qarani. He said, we want to be like Zuhud, like him. He said, you can never carry it. 
bid'a deen that is good. For example, Uwais al-Qarani would wake up in the night and he would say, tonight is going to be the night for ruku'ah. And he would spend the whole night in ruku'ah. Just ruku'ah. And making zikr in ruku'ah. And making dua in ruku'ah. I don't know if he read Quran in Ruku. And on another night, Sayyidina Uwais al-Qarani would wake up and he said, tonight is the night of sujood. He would spend the whole night in sujood. This is mentioned with uh, Sanab by Imam al-Laknawi in his book about the, uh, the ibadah of the Salaf. The examples of ibadah of the Salaf al-Salih, that is all bid'ah. Bid'ah in the sense that it was not done by the uh, the Prophet ﷺ, it was not done by the companions. Is this deen or dunya? This is deen, clearly. Is it a bid'ah? Of course, it, it is something that was not done before. It was something that he came up without any model before. And it is in the deen. If you say, well, he shouldn't have done it. This is wrong. Okay, then. It is between you, not between you and Uwais. It's between you and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Uwais al-Kharani is Khayru tabi'in Khayru tabi'in the best of the tabi'in He named him, even though Uwais did not meet him. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew about him. He said he's the best of the tabi'in. This is why the Sayyid al-Tabi'in is Uwais al-Kharani. So, uh, he, he recommended him. And yet, Sayyidina Uwais, he, he did these practices. So he did this pra these practices in Deen, and he did the other practice that I mentioned first in Dunya. And they are both good. Now I give you examples of bad practices in Deen and Dunya. For example, um, there was one, uh, <laughs> one Wahhabi, he made a video really recently, and he was cursing someone and saying, you are so stupid, you are so, well, you, are, you should never have done this, you, you are uh, and naming that person by name. And then he's saying, did Allah do what happened in Iraq? So is Iraq getting better? So Allah is Afghanistan getting better? Ask the Iraqis. The country is destroyed. Allah did that. Did Allah do that? What happened in Iraq during the war? So he, in the end, he, he is saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not in charge of history. Allah is not in charge of what happens in the world, in the universe. Subhanallah. I thought when I saw that, I thought, Ya Latif, what, what belief is this? This is certainly not uh, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And uh, I think it's not even Islamic to believe like that. Because if it is Islamic, but not al sunnah al it is the belief of the Qadariya. The Qadariya, they would say that Allah does not know what people do. When it happens, when they do it, then he finds out. He sees what they do, he, he finds out. He is not, and as if uh, they are creating their own acts. This is why Imam al-Bukhari, he wrote his book, Khalq Af'al al-Ibad. That all the acts of uh, creatures, they are created by Allah. Allah is in charge of your history, ya, ya who? Of course, everything happens by his will. In Iraq and elsewhere than Iraq, there is no escape from it. Not even, you cannot lift your little finger unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates it for you. So that uh, is a bid'ah in the deen that is evil and that is uh, the bid'ah of uh, Qadariya, Qadariya sects. And uh, many of the imams of uh, Ahl al-Sunnah al-Jama'ah refuted it, like Imam al-Juwayni and others. And worse than that is to be Majusi, the Zoroastrian, because they believed in the God of good and the God of evil. So fighting one another and each one creates Whatever is the, the specialty of that one. The God of good creates good. The God of evil creates evil. So I don't know if that Wahhabi thought that which, what, whatever belief he is uh, following, I, I hope that uh, 
he realizes what he is saying and repents from that. Say shahada, take back what you said, because this is, this is not correct, this is not Islamic. So that is the uh, bad bid'ah in the religion. I mentioned the good one in the religion with Uwais, and I mentioned the good bid'ah in, uh, in the dunya by Uwais. Now the bad bid'ah in dunya, this uh, Sheikh Dr. Dato Mufti Muhammad uh, Asri saying at the end of his book that the only good uh, bid'ah is the bid'ah in dunya. And he gives as an example to create new weapons. He says the Muslims should be creating new weapons. He said, subhanallah, that this is the only example that he could find that uh, is a good, uh, good innovation and to create new weapons. So uh, I rem it reminded me of a statement by uh, Maulana Sheikh Nazim Qadda Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said one time, Alhamdulillah, that it was not Muslims who invented the atomic bomb. Alhamdulillah. And you could add to that also, Alhamdulillah, that it is not Muslims who invented Nepalm also. Alhamdulillah, it's not Muslims who invented cluster bombs and grenades and explosives like that, cluster. Alhamdulillah, it's not Muslims who invented mines you know the mines that you plant mm -hmm. under the earth and they can endure for 50 years and be forgotten and then one child or animal will walk uh, one day on a road and then be be killed by that or maimed by it so because it is forbidden to also burn it is forbidden to to kill without reason, without even seeing who is being killed. It is all haram. It can never be a good innovation in that respect. So what kind of uh, weapons do you, do, do you wish to, to invent? I thought it was such a bad example to give because immediately you think of weapons of mass destruction and mass destruction is haram by definition in Islam. Because uh, that, that is one of the signs of the ends of time. So this is one of the, I mean that the person who is killed will not know who kills, who is killing or why they are being killed like that. And the person who is doing the killing is not, doesn't know why they are killing or who they are killing because they do not see, because they are killed from a distance using a lot of what now, st satellites like in Star, uh, star Wars, and you know, uh, missiles that they go into orbit before they they come back down again, and uh, and civilian target targeting civilians, etc. They are doing that. Imagine if they now could invent the weapons for doing that uh, as well. Then it would be more more sin, uh, more sin. But this is not what I wish for. And I thought it was a terrible example to use. Allahu Taala Alam. Perhaps we will continue next time, inshallah, next week. This was a good session, an hour and a half, mashallah. Thank you all for joining. Are very inspiring and very encouraging. This is the madad of Maulana, and it is like our common capital. Let us use it, put it to use, inshallah, and grow it. And uh, go to work. And inshallah, Allah will reward each and every one, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and teach us, protect us and our beloved ones and protect all of the ummah. And may Allah bless Maulana, grant him long life and good health and shifa and uh, rida and good pleasure. And keep us with him, Ya Rabbi, in dunya and akhirah ma'al ladhina an'amta alayhi min al-nabiyyin wa al-siddiqin wa shuhadai wa al-salihin wa hasuna ulaika rafiqa. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد سيد الأولين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد سيد الآخرين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد حتى تارث الأرض ومن عليها وأنت خير الوارثين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين زيادة إلى شرف النبي المصطفى صلى الله عليه وسلم وآله وصحبه الكرام 
ومشايخنا في طريقة نكشبندية عالية خاصة يروح أستاذنا وأستاذ أستاذنا الفاتح Thank you, Yashir. Sure. Inshallah, I'll see you next week again with another hot topic. Thank you for organizing this. Inshallah, we'll continue the same, the same talk, part two, Inshallah.